ráno, odpoledne, poledne, vlastně přesně. Já vás tady všechny vítám Noon, na inspiračním fóru, Welcome to the Inspiration Forum as part of the International Documentary Festival Jihlava. Today is called e-panoptikon and we will speak about the future of digital technologies from different views. Today's panel is called Uvidíme, the se bavit way to the online world and the imminent threats of this, this step, of this move. We will speak about what it means that all of us move online more and more. My name is Maria Hermanova. I am an anthropologist and sociologist. I work at the Academy of Sciences, where I research social media influences and social media in general. I would like to welcome our guests, our speakers. There is Leonhard Müller next to me, an Austrian artist and game theorist. He represents the Total Refusal Collective, which is defined as a pseudo-Marxist media guerrilla. So we will see today's, uh, during today's discussion what it actually means. There is Katarina Smekalova, a researcher at Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Prague. She researches digital inequalities, future of work, and so on. And on your right side, Daniel Leisegang, a political scientist and one of the editors of netspolitik.org, who is interested in digital rights, digital freedoms, and social and political context of the internet. So welcome, everybody. So, this is it for the beginning. So, I would like to ask the first question to our guests. Když se vy osobně zamyslíte nad tím, bavíme se tady o přesunu online a změnami, které s tím souvisí, the shift to the online world from your point of view what is the biggest change related to this shift to the online world the question sounds vague but is there a change that we don't speak about so often that is maybe not so visible but but from your perspective it is important so can we start uh, maybe Leonard, can you start um, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for having me here. I'm very, very happy um, to be here, the artist clown, let's say, <laughs> amongst these very serious uh, researchers. Um, and um, like, m m to answer your question is, um, I'm like m most of the research, um, my collective total refusal in me is doing is um, about the politicality of. Uh, of digital images, um, which disguises its politicality. So um, uh, this this kind of shift has taken place um, the most as we are completely like swallowed by kind of um, how do you say uh, like a one particular machinery of images, which um, is like academically described as hyperrealism. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and this, this, politic, this, this politics of images are made by marketing. So um, whatever we are looking at, if it's advertisement, it's, if it's on our digital screens, um, if it's on the info screen in the, in the, in the subway or in the train or whatever, wherever, um, we are mostly watching kind of uh, um, marketing imagery is um, so when we think of an artifact or of a person we don't know yet we um, um, like we upload um, our information from this collective archive of um, capitalist imagery so this is what is concerning us a lot and um, certainly, of course, um, video games, which are the poster boy of this story, of this um, hyperreal imagery. Yeah, and, and to answer also a bit less um, um, stiff and academically, maybe um, personally, like my personal shift um, 
uh, or a change has taken place via this kind of um, um, hyperlinked attention span, of course. So I'm, I'm doing very hard to focus on one screen. Um, I have like like you maybe to like hundreds of tabs tabs open and so I listen to music and do whatever else and eat while I do everything and, and, and be on social media and having a phone call. Um, and of of course this 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 changes a lot. So um, um, what what I'm what I'm interested in is what does what how, how the gaming industry is reacting on that. Like, there was a study about Tencent, which is the biggest gaming mm -hmm. development camp company in the world. It's the Chinese one, mostly doing mobile games. And they um, had done a study. Um, and in this study, um, the future of video games um, is, um, or basically they, they want to develop more games, which are second screen games. So you have your first screen, and this first screen, there is your Excel sheet or your, or your Word doc, and then you have a second one. Or you have your Zoom, um, and then you have your game. So recently I was uh, having a Zoom with a friend, and, um, and then unfortunately like the, the, cable came, the chinch cable came out, and I didn't realize that the um, shooting sound was like um, getting into the Zoom, and then the other one was saying, "I hearing gaming sound," and so on. And, and, uh, <laughs> I was so ashamed. Like this, and this, 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 of course, does make something with with video games as well. So, so if you have second screen games, they are obviously not telling a very good story. They are obviously not going deeply into whatever um, uh, discourse. They are just like Candy Crushy or. Candy so, if I understand it correctly, second screen games me. Ja mám mluvit česky, pardon. <laughs> Sorry, I'm supposed to speak Czech. So, if I understand it correctly. Second screen games mean that they are developed in a way that we will never stop playing them. Exactly. So, um, it, I mean, you have this, like the, the biggest gaming market, I will maybe later come back to that topic, is the mobile game market. So it's, it's not for us core and pro gamers. Um, but it's 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 uh, it's it's more for the for for the uh, for the non gamers. So the m most games and the biggest market is for the non games. So they don't stop playing because they can do it everywhere. And um, um, every kind of media, social media, tries to swallow you completely. Like it's a com it's a metaverse approach. You're completely right, Maria. Regarding metaverse, uh, this buzzword, uh, we will definitely not be able to avoid this, and we will get back to this. But now let's move on to Katka. What is the biggest change, according to you, connected with the shift to the online world? Thank you for the floor. And I will follow up on what Leonard said. What I'm interested in about uh, internet is political economy. So what are um, the functional mechanisms behind it, who shapes the system with what interests in mind, and also how through this power can be exerted. It is, of course, a question of power. So when I look at the internet, I would say that it is different, it has a different quality from what we were used to, and also it is sometimes overlooked. It is a new environment designed by someone. Because we need to bear in mind that there is always a designer to this environment. When we try to describe a new phenomenon, we always look for things that are the same with what we already know. But if we don't find such things, we say that this has new qualities and we need to describe it in a new way. 
if we look at the internet, you can say that before that there were already spaces where people were moving, uh, spaces that were also designed in certain ways. For example, urbanistic spaces. For example, if you enter a supermarket, that is also a space with a special design that wants you to spend as much money as possible. But I think that the physical reality still made it possible for us to escape it. You could avoid spending too much money, you could just go to nature. But on the internet, everything is being shaped and designed with certain interests in mind. And it is a space created for profit. So for me, it makes sense not to discuss the internet, but to discuss digital capitalism, because that is what internet is in terms of political economy. And there are more subtle mechanisms that influence us. Again, more subtle than in the physical reality. Of course, we have urbanist designers. There are principles that can influence people where they stay, what path they choose. But I would say that the digital tools are much more subtle and much more dangerous because they are overlooked. We are more vulnerable to them. And they are simply omnipresent. We are constantly being influenced there. For example, when we were influenced by urban design. The point was to make us spend our time in a better way. But on the internet, we are meant to spend there as much time as possible, provide our data also about where we are located. And that, again, is a big difference. Because it is something that gets so close to us in a different way than what was happening before. Our emotions, our social contacts are being exploited. That is something completely new about the digital capitalism through the use of data. I think that the use of perspective is that we actually do not realize that all of this is happening. We think that the internet is neutral, that it is a place where we can have fun, where we can buy things, but we normally do not realize that this is something we should think about, that this is actually a business thing. And that's not accidental, because we are not meant to know this. The goal is for us to never realize that this is the case. There is this power asymmetry. The know-how is not evenly distributed. There is asymmetry in terms, a, an asymmetry in terms of algorithms. So that is the thing that I find important, but also hidden. And one last thing, we do not know what to do about this. I said that users are normally not aware of this. But then comes the question, okay, what do we do with a reasonable user approach? How do we get there when a majority of us are not aware? And even if we get there, maybe that won't be enough because there is this asymmetry of power and politicians don't know what to do about it because this digital space is so different from the physical reality that we do not have tools to regulate this in order to be in the public interest. Thank you. This was a, quite a depressing answer, also a very com complex and comprehensive one. So, okay, there are games being played that maybe we wouldn't like to keep playing, but we cannot avoid it. And there is no going back because we don't know what the alternatives are. 
Okay, we will keep this for the Q&A. And now I would like to ask Daniel about his perspective. What do you think is the biggest change and also the most overlooked change? Yeah, maybe I start with, um, with two things you said. The first one was hyper-reality and the second one was um, the Internet is economy and the Internet is the walled gardens, more or less. And I'm quite old in Internet terms. Uh, I remember the Internet when it wasn't there. And people speak about the blackout that uh, is, is about to happen maybe in the, in, the, in the next few weeks and months. And people compare it to the 90s. They say it will be like the early 90s once it happens. We won't have any smartphones, we won't have any Internet and so on. And I remember um, moving online, and this is a personal approach. I remember when I was, um, it was like in the end of the 90s when I went to the, a, a trip over Europe and I bought a little radio. Uh, and this radio had only one um, purpose for me, um, to receive information because the daily uh, news was always late and I don't know, I, I needed the news, so I bought this thing. And this was the first gadget I bought. And the second one, and there was, of course, a desktop computer at home. And a few years later, something changed. You could dial in also before, but I was studying uh, in the early 2000 and then the end of 1990s. And then um, you, the, the, this was the days when, these were the days when you had to dial into the internet and you pulled out information. And then a few years later, and this is the moment I remember when you asked about the personal moment moving online. Um, I remember the day even when we got connected to a DSL uh, modem the first time. And this was so weird because uh, the computer was working and shifting data online, offline, uh, both ways the first time. And I didn't get it. I didn't understand why the computer was making the hard disk was making these sounds. Something was happening there, although I wasn't sitting in the computer. And then the iPhone came the little gadget that did the same thing in my pocket. And now we have something completely different. Now, like when we look at the internet today that you mentioned, um, then um, Facebook came up like a bit before the iPhone came. And they used this data that was sucked out from my computer, from my smartphone later, and they used it in order to create a social graph and this is something that we used to talk about. We know what the social graph is, more or less. It's like, what is the connection between people on the campus where Mark Zuckerberg introduced the first Facebook? Like, how is person A related to B? This is the social graph. But now we have something else, and this is something we don't talk about enough, I think, not yet. Uh, and this creates maybe another reality uh, which we will uh, maybe realize once the blackout will come. Um, um, and this is the interest graph, and this is, and this is a reality that works completely different because if we use TikTok these days and if we use the metaverse in the future, um, then it's not about how people are connected, all of us in the room, which are now analyzed right now, but what is the potential interest of the person watching the feed in order to keep them in the loop? And this is something completely different. If I use TikTok, I'm not socially active. I am giving input, a little bit of input, so that AI, whatever that is, can tell me um, what my interest is. And this is, if I, if I go back to the first radio that I bought and the first desktop computer that I dialed in with these funny sounds that it made, this is a long way moving online. And the question is, um, what is there left of the internet? What is left of what we think uh, we moved to when we went online. And I would say, and this is maybe something we can discuss, the internet is not uh, Facebook, not at all. The internet is uh, hyperlinks and it's still there and it still can be rescued, uh, I would say. I again wanted to speak English, sorry. That is a nice, think for me to follow up with my next question. I focus on spreading conspiration theories online 
and there is a popular theory in some corners of the internet that the internet doesn't exist anymore, that there are just users and that the internet is dead, there are only bots keeping this going. So this was just the association I had when you spoke about this. Also, it is interesting to see that sometimes these theories turn to be true. But now let's move on to the next question. Daniel opened up this topic. We are moving more and more online, but where actually are we moving? What are the places we are moving to? We mentioned that there is the notion that we spend more and more time on Facebook, on TikTok, what this means and where do you think we will get in the next years? Do you think there will be some concrete platforms or concrete things that we will be doing online? Leona, do you want to start again? Um, I really love your um, optimistic approach. Um, um, and we'll counter it with um, a very grim um, perspective on future. Um, I think we are on a, we're on a highway on, uh, onto cyberpunk, um, which is a kind of the dark version of uh, science fiction. Maybe you've um, heard about a video game um, um, from CD projects, and there is like it, it roots back into the 80s uh, when this kind of uh, science fiction was um, funded or invented. Um, when the first like when the when the first social state um, f facilities had been taken over by corporate um, um, monopolies and so on, um, science. In, in the West, like f science fiction um, uh, storytellers were f finding, founding this cyberpunk and make, making, a, were making a kind of a um, dystopian anticipation, a caricature of what will become so in the future, which is still stucking aesthetically in the 80s, um, um, which I like. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, we we have uh, we have um, mega corporations which taking over any kind of um, um, social facilities. So um, it's the Medicare, uh, it's it's the education as a, like healthcare and so on. Um, um, people are working their asses off um, to just pay the rents from like mega corporate. Um, Real estate uh, corporation. So I ask you, what is what is true about this dystopia and what is not true? Like 40 years later, um, a lot is true, um, and also that social space is has become kind of um, a private corporate um, dystopia. Like if you think of um, bits. Business improvement districts, like when you think of this kind of the the this, uh, the, the city in, in in the London city with London City, which is kind of this uh, business business improvement district, this bit, um, it resembles public space, but it's actually like. Uh, like a fake public space. Um, so it's completely owned by corporates and um, private ownership, and it's, uh, it's regulated heavily and over -securificated. So um, the internet is kind of a bit because it resembles a public space, um, but it's heavily restricted by whatever corporates want it to be. So um, now, um, um, as public discourse kind of shifted through social media, through Twitter, um, through Reddit, whatever, um, into, the, into the digital space. Um, some monopolists um, 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 are now kind of the, the ones who can, who can, who can um, think of what can be said and what not. So they, they have, have taken over the power of what is said and what not. This is, this is very grim, so I need you, 
very much <laughs> to make my like because it's like it's a future becoming true and the other thing and by that future had been killed so we don't have an but this is another topic um <laughs> there is uh, so the idea of future like the utopia is is by that like by by the cyberpunk which which made everything and the dystopia becoming presence we killed our utopias <laughs> Uh, this was my hobby English, I'm sorry. I've been just uh, thinking about the father of cyberpunk, William Gibson, who said the future is here, but it is not evenly distributed. So this, this is it. I will try to pass this question to Katka. Maybe she will tell us something more optimistic than corporate dystopia. Let us see. Uh, pardon. Uh, no, um, Sorry, so I tend to see it from the perspective of the political economy. So I don't really see individual stakeholders moving in their uh, what are the decisions they take and uh, what it brings. But I uh, look at the material function logics that are behind all this. Regarding the economy of internet, internet is expanding. It is expanding to more and more areas of our life. It uh, uses more and more things. Usually these are things that before internet were not even possible to be marketed, such as our contacts or preferences. Before internet, it was not possible to market all this. These are things that are very human. And if we could make this decision, we maybe would not deliberately let other people access and market this information. But we are doing it because uh, we cannot move around internet without this. Nick Senik's book, Platform Capitalism, is a big inspiration to me. It is a very short book. It looks very, very it's a very small book, but it shows, it describes in a very visionary way that uh, digital capitalism is trying to make the big tech corporations that uh, are in, in clash. They uh, fight for a position of uh, internet as such, and then the winner would become world as such, the metaverse. So uh, the logics of capitalism do not enable any other functioning. And the main thing is the data. So who has data has more and more data. So you buy your competitors you use more and more people's information. You, thanks to the network effect, you can get more and more people and suck them into your universe. So the idea of Mark Zuckerberg is that at some point we do absolutely everything in the internet world. We meet our friends, we learn there. We do everything. So at first, I will become the internet, and then I will become the world. So I can see the expansion logic here. From the materialistic point of view, it is clear. Unfortunately, it is not based on our decisions, such as users or politicians. There are some uncertainties. We are not sure if Facebook will be the winner or if TikTok will be the winner, and Facebook will fade into, uh, will, will just fade away. But the direction is clear. There cannot be any other direction. So this was not very optimistic. 
but the definition, I will become the internet and then I will become the world, that's one of the best definitions of metaverse that I've ever heard. So thank you for that. And then uh, maybe let's see if Daniel has a more optimistic answer, but if not, well, it doesn't matter. It does maybe. Um, the translation word maybe it doesn't matter, so I wanted to respond. It does maybe, but I'm I, I'm not that optimistic. Uh, I, I, there was a misunderstanding. I'm I'm just there is. Uh, I, I, it's just that I would like to go one step further in the analysis, um, because I I would paint a different picture. Um, the city, if you compare the internet to the city, I think there's a mistake. Uh, the city has limited space. Uh, I lived in Berlin for 20 years now, and uh, the space there, the, the open space has shrinked because it was occupied. In the internet, it hasn't shrinked. The space in the internet is endless, theoretically. We just have given up using the open spaces. We didn't go to the, to the illegal club downstairs in the cellar. We went to the mall, uh, because all our friends are in the mall. Uh, and the internet still has these places. It's n <laughs> the only problem is there's nobody there. It's empty. Um, but it's even for free. Uh, the other one isn't for free. The mall, you, you give your data and you, you, you're plugged in everything once you enter there. And you're surveyed uh, by the state, by companies, and so on. Um, so I would, um, I think it's, it's difficult to say, okay, there is this open space is still there and we can use it. We just have to occupy it again. It doesn't work this way. We all try to go to Mastodon at some place, maybe, or to different social networks uh, because we think, okay, uh, Elon Musk is buying Twitter tomorrow, uh, so we need to go and, and rescue our data from him. It, it probably won't happen this way. Um, but I, what I meant is by going a bit further in the analysis is I don't think the question is anymore uh, does TikTok win, does, does Facebook win or whatever. It's which technology will happen next. Um, and what will happen next is uh, probably AR and VR, which means like augmented reality and virtual reality, um, which whatever it will look like will have one effect on all of us we will be scanned, our biometric data will be scanned. This will be a huge step forward towards surveillance by state, by companies, but mostly by companies and the state will probably use this data, which means like now the social graph is analyzed, now the interest graph is analyzed. Am I interested in dogs or cats on the internet or even more politically or am I gay or not gay, whatever. All this information flows into the system and gives me new things that I can consume for hours and on TikTok and so on. But what will happen now is uh, the, v the VR and the AR is not only using our biometric data in order to know us better, in order to sell us ads that we cannot just click away once we are in this world. It will be there and we, there won't be any ad block uh, system that will hide it from us. But also new products will come. Uh, and this is mostly absurd, like digital sneakers that I can buy for five euros and use in specific areas in this mall. Um, but even a third thing will happen, and this is the most, the, the, the most dangerous thing, is it will be a digital infrastructure on its own. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, yesterday, he presented the new qu quarter numbers and the investors are not amused and so on. But he also said again one thing, I want to be the internet in the future, which means, and he just collaborated with Teams and Microsoft in order to do that, I want to be your office, I want to be your free time place, I want to be your concert hall, I want to be the place where you meet your friends for games and so on and so on. I want to be the place where you buy your shoes, your fashion, whatever. Which means the internet of the future will be either will be a mega app. It will be what we what we already know from WeChat in Asia, where you can buy it, uh, stuff, a ticket, an airplane ticket, where you can order a taxi and so on. But now you can do it in 3D, and 
the Mega Meta app will offer you all this, or the Microsoft Meta app will offer you that, or the Apple Meta app will offer you that, but you can pick among the three and they will give you everything. And you won't go to work anymore, you won't have a monitor in front of you. That's the, the wet dream of Mark Zuckerberg. But you will have the display, the, you put the Googles on, the glasses on, and you will have different displays in front of you. But then they know everything what you do. This is the shift that is happening as the next step uh, technologically and economically and culturally uh, speaking, I think. Does uh, Leonard or Katka uh, react to this? I saw you nodding, so uh, is there anything you would like to say? Mm. Um, I, I don't want my my uh, my image of uh, of of city will be destroyed by you. So I start the next attempt. Um, so like you have the mega cities which kind of consume its its areas in vast uh, uh, speed. So um, also like not mega cities like Vienna, like gains 300,000 inhabitants in three or four years. So like the internet is also like consuming other spaces and getting it in. And there is also like the, the illegal club downstairs, which is of course the dark net. But maybe let's switch away from um, metaphors. <laughs> okay, I think that the metaphors are actually quite useful to understand all this, to imagine this. I would just, uh, I'm just thinking about one thing. I was preparing a question where I wanted to follow up on the capitalism of platforms that Katka mentioned, the concept of platforms. So what are the platforms? What is, what is it defined? What is seen as a platform? And I think that you maybe a little bit answered this question. So I'm wondering if the concept of platforms is still making sense, if in the near future there will be some kind of uh, merger of everything into one metaverse, as you described this what dream of Mark Zuckerberg. But maybe I will still ask you this question. So do you think that the concept of platforms is useful at all? Or do you need a different, do we need a different technology? Or I mean a different terminology, different definition? Well, I think that it still is useful, this concept. But you are right that as soon as there is a metaverse, we will have to change this terminology and these concepts. But uh, just a side note, there is a big question if metaverse will happen. I still don't know what to think about it, because on the one hand, Mark Zuckerberg is very serious about it. I don't know if you've seen the, his ads. I don't know if it's happening in the Czech space. I've more seen it in the German space. There are huge ads in Spiegel, which is one of the biggest journals where Mark Zuckerberg uh, appears all the time. Uh, I have seen it on Instagram already, but uh, if you advertise in newspapers that say in the future surgeons will learn in metaverse, then if you do this, you must be kind of serious, even though in technologies you always want to lure investors, you always think big. So it is very difficult to know if it will happen. At the moment, at the very moment, this is not happen This is not possible with the technologies we have. There is no 5G at all. There are some glasses that we have, some headsets, but there is not enough 5G. So this is a big, big venture. But the trend is clear, as I've said already, and we all agree. Maybe it won't be a metaverse, but maybe at some point it will be something different, but a very similar. Everything will be integrated thanks to data into one space that we ideally never leave whatever we do on internet. I will now shortly comment to the platforms. At the moment, it m makes very much sense to me to speak about platform capitalism, as Nick Cernik was mentioning. And I think that in Czechia we are not serious 
enough about this because we I, we speak about Facebook, Airbnb, Amazon in an isolated way. And this is nice because every platform works a little bit differently in detail. But like this, we are missing the functional logic which all these platforms share. And without understanding these logics, we don't know how to speak about this. For example, the Czech discussion about Uber or Airbnb is very symptomatic. We absolutely don't understand the concept. Yes, we speak about if it's a competition with taxi drivers, but if you don't understand the principle such as that the platforms are global, uh, what is their work model, what is their labor model, then you will not understand the phenomenon. So I think that it is necessary to speak about platforms before there is something new. I can't help it, but whenever we speak about metaverse and whether it is a real option that will materialize in the future, I remember Mark Zuckerberg releasing a video a fortnight ago about how quickly Metaverse is developing, that people can already move their feet in it, but then it turned out that it was a hoax that, hoax that uh, the feet uh, were actually just animated in that video. So this is just a funny thing maybe to keep this debate a little bit lighter. Leonard or Daniel, would you like to say something more about platforms? Um, yeah, just a short remark. I, uh, I, I totally agree that we need this term. Like we need uh, to keep this idea alive, what is happening there, because otherwise we cannot talk about it um, economically and understand what's happening there. I just don't like the term. Digital platform doesn't say anything. Nobody understands it actually. What is it? A uh, digital platform, a platform, digital, it's data-driven capitalism. That's what it is. Like, um, and maybe it makes sense. You mentioned Nick's book, and he describes it very well. Um, uh, in 2007, 2008, we had the global financial crisis, and and we need and these companies needed profit. That's what they needed. They have stocks. They needed to satisfy their investors. So they they put everything they. Uh, put all their effort behind one goal to become as monopolistic as possible to in order to gain as much users as possible and to get the data and this data can make be made into profit and this development is happening right now again uh, it repeats itself like 15 years later um, Facebook is um, fighting for its survival uh, TikTok is coming and others and this shift from social to interest graph is happening and what Mark Zuckerberg is trying with all his desperate um, uh, all the desperation that he shows every time and that makes it so ironic to this leg thing is crazy <laughs> everything is crazy what this man is doing right now like this is you observe it you think what's going on and and uh, m m people that have their money in it say stop like we lose a lot of money Facebook loses every day in the past year they lose $1.5 billion every day on the stock market. Uh, people get nervous, of course. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to establish a technology that isn't ready yet. He's trying to draw a plan saying in 10 years time, we'll make so much money. Pro I promise you, you just have to trust me. Looking at what they are developing, um, I, I hardly doubt that they will succeed. The technology is far from ready. They don't even know, even the metaverse employers don't use it. They don't understand it. They don't know what the plan is. Internally, they call the, the, the key projects, they call MMH, Make Mark Happy. That's the name for it. <laughs> it's only to satisfy the need of one guy who rules this company and others do as well. And we have Microsoft and we have ByteDance and they are not much better than this. So the data-driven business, the capitalism behind it, that's the key thing in order to make profit. And it's the hunger for profit that turns this engine going forward where one question is asked, what purpose, why? Why do we need a 3D world? I'm not against this technology. This technology is probably great once it works. And I'm like Matrix and Tron and all these movies showed it to us how magnificent it can be. But it's not our world. 
it's Mark Zuckerberg's world, and we enter it, and we watch it, and we consume it, and they consume us, and it's like, yeah, it's data-driven capitalism, and this is why I don't like the term digital platforms. Thank you for a very exhaustive answer. I remembered about move fast, break things, uh, a slogan of Mark Zuckerberg that maybe will stop working now with all the lost billions of dollars. Uh, Leonard, do you want to add something? If that's not the case, we can move on to the next question, which goes directly to you. Speaking about all these changes, we speak also a lot about gamification. So I wonder, what do you think this means? How the gamification is manifested in our daily lives? It strikes me that, for example, Brent, Brent Feldman, a journalist, says that when we look at the game industry, we often see that it actually shows the trends to come in the near future of the Internet. As an example, he says that uh, platforms such as Fortnite are functional versions of metaverse. He also says that uh, the game industry actually started with commodifying software that you buy, for example, Match and other things. I don't know what else you can add or buy to add up to your games. Also, there are NFTs, non-fungible tokens, a concept uh, of something that is free of charge, uh, some, but that can now be sold, for example, memes and other things. So I'm interested to know what you think about this, whether gamification is a trend and what it means. Of course, it's a trend. Um, but the, my, my counter question would be why we do have so less anti-capitalists. It must be millions of people if you think of uh, um, a system which is exploiting even CEOs. So, um, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's like a, um, a extremely um, a deep, like a non-empowering but uh, super repressive system. And I, the answer is, this, the system is repressive, but it hides its repression. And gamification is one of the reasons. So gamification is hiding, disguising, and outsourcing control to yourself. So you are an employee not battling against those who are in control, like your bosses, um, but you're battling against yourself because it's a game. Um, you have to be better than yourself. You have to be better, of course, than maybe your colleagues and other employees. But first, you have to, like in sports, you have to um, go th uh, over your own threshold in order to achieve something. And this is super dangerous. So if we have a kind of utopian vision of gamification, and I'm not completely against gamification, um, it's just that we uh, need it without a profit-orientated system. Then we can make happy, work happy and make nice games out of our work. And if, if, I think it's even necessary for super alienated work, for um, work which needs to be done, but um, um, someone needs to do it, that we need it kind of to do it kind of more like funny. But it's, it's, a, it's a danger to say that, of course, because we know that um, it's super exploitative. And you said something else um, about um, um, uh, Fortnite. What was the...? Uh, that was just uh, quoting Ryan Willman, who says that when we look at the development in the game industry, it is often the forecast of what will happen in the internet uh, as a whole. And an example of that is Fortnite or Roblox, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's go, it goes back and forth, so it's not one direction, so not video games. So, so, so video games are, of course, um, 
um, modeled by society. So in late capitalism, hyper capitalism market system, we um, establish or we, we find a new um, gameplay established, which is battle royale. So um, social Darwinism <laughs> becomes like the most like uh, played gameplay in video game industry, so everyone against everyone. So, and this is what the next generation is playing, like with Fortnite, for example. Um, of course, this will reflect back um, to society. And um, back, coming back to, to the platform idea, um, there is no such a term like platform games, because plat platform games means just side-scrolling games like Super Mario and so on. It's something different, something nice in, <laughs> in contrast to, to, to platform capitalism. Um, and I would say, but, but games become more and more platformish. Mm -hmm. So microtransaction, for example, becoming a, a or are a super thing. So you're exploiting um, they're very young, um, um, playing um, Fortnite and customizing their identity. Because if you're customized, like if your skin, if, you're, uh, if your look looks like level one, which is like the basic uh, default um, costume you wear in a game, like your skin, then others think that yeah, this is a noob. She or he isn't investing enough. So you want to have the Leopardi costume, costume or whatever costume. And then you need to have like 70 euros to get a loot box or another loot box, but get, get some variables. Um, and then you find your identity. So this is, this is, this is uh, like the most money is in video games is made by free to play. So it's free, but it, it, it makes the most revenue. And coming back to mobile games, it's, which is the biggest market, think of the video game market of 2022, it has a revenue of $200 million, a billion dollars. So five years ago, it was just half the revenue, $100 billion, so it doubled its size uh, of, um, of revenue in just um, five years. And 150 billions of these 200 billion dollars go into mobile games. So these are free-to-play games. So these are microtransaction games. These are, so it's it. The most money comes by free-to-play by non-gamers, by those who aren't dedicate themselves to be gamers at all. So by Candy Crush people. So this is this is, <laughs> this is a very funny time. Uh. Zároveň mi to zase otvírá prostor pro další otázku, kterou bych chtěla... Okay, this leads me to another question I wanted to ask uh, to Kateřina. When someone has to do something, gamification can be a way to make it less boring, less uh, difficult. But I know you, Katka, that you uh, focus on what is happening on the labor market, uh, on the inequalities uh, on the labor market. Can you maybe discuss this a little bit? What are the consequences in this sphere? And what threats do you see there? Well, I have two things to mention. The second one will relate to your last question about gamification. But now, let's get to the first thing. We are speaking here about technology, about whether it is advanced or not, what is being already automated by algorithms. But I think we also need to say that the Internet is not yet as automated as we think it is. In the background, there are armies of people doing things that we already think are automated. For example, the recognition of images, or they actually teach the AI to be able to recognize things in the future and decide for itself. This is an important thing to mention, because there are still a lot of people working in terrible conditions, actually, because if we don't even know they are there, probably they are not working in great conditions. 
They were hired for this job via digital platforms because many of them are just mediators, hiring workers, Amazon, Mechanical Turk, for example. Again, Amazon is already mentioned in the title. Why Amazon here? Do they also have a platform that hires workers? Again, this is another case of expansion of platforms in different fields. And then you have those workers doing work that is not terribly well paid. I don't know if you have seen the documentary Giving Up. I learned there that Amazon in developing countries has workers, for example, in Africa that just keep clicking, doing stupid work that we think is already automated, is done by the Internet, and they are paid it paid with Amazon vouchers. What it is to be, right? This is an important thing to mention. And that brings me to the topic of platforms as such. Platforms uh, that provide work. Because there are also gamification elements to them. And those elements make it relatively difficult to categorize this work relating to the categories of work we used to know. For example, if you have platforms like Uber, they say that they are just a digital interface and that freelancers work for them. This is problematic, however. If you want to have a closer look and decide whether this is true, let's just check whether the so-called freelancers or free workers can decide what the pay will be, when they work, whether they mention the name of the company uh, on, for example, their cars, etc. So with these platforms, it's more about dependent work, not really about freelancing. But one decisive thing, these platforms often say that their workers can decide freely when they work and when they don't. Well, if we, for example, compare this to interfaces uh, in uh, uh, the past, when you would just come, uh, see an ad, a work ad, and decide when to work. Okay, that was the case, but the platforms have other tools to make you work. They need to have enough drivers at peak hours. So they have dynamic pricing, which again is something very problematic, because you as a worker never know in advance how much you will earn. That depends on the demand. By the way, also this is unpredictable for the users too. But they simply need tools to make you drive when they need you. So unlike notice boards, they have other gamification elements, pop-up windows telling you, wow, today you are part of the best 5% of our drivers. Keep running for two more hours, you will be given extra bonuses. Another star or something like that. But what does this actually mean? What does it mean for our conservative legislation on dependent work or freelancing? Is this really freelancing? Because freelancing can be ignored, right? But these things, or you can ignore these pop-up windows, but psychologically it is so difficult to ignore this. Okay, I won't be the best, I won't have this extra start, extra star. This is maybe not the best example because they can also have more sophisticated mechanisms to persuade you. But what does this tell us about the platform? Is this platform an employer? Well, not in the sense that you have working hours, that you have a contract, but at the same time, we cannot say that you are free 
when working for them. So this is a new type of challenges that we are facing now with these platforms. Thank you for your answer. I think that this is a very specific threat that will require specific political solutions. So I will soon give floor to the audience, but I would like to ask one last question to Daniel. We were speaking about the impact of gamification, platformization, and what is the impact on work? Daniel mentioned one more important topic before that we've been discussing as an imminent threat, and that is the question of our digital privacy and surveillance of the platforms over our private life. So maybe, Daniel, can you comment more on this? So what is this imminent threat in this area? You want me to speak about privacy itself, or um, should I give more optimism in the end? <laughs> well, uh, you can choose. Maybe I make a combination. Um, um, if we talk, I think um, there is a European approach to regulate the digital platforms. Uh, which is like coming 15 years too late. It's called DSA and DMA, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. Um, it's not that bad. It could work, um, and it will definitely change some things. Um, but what we are seeing now coming in the near future is far bigger, far more threatening, because it's going to the bodies of the people, and it's much more immersive. I mean, that's the term they always use for augmented and especially virtual reality. It's like you feel it what, when you are in these worlds. So it's like when you feel it, they can feel you and they can uh, get the data from you. Um, so what can we do about this? I think there are three things we should do, and that's where I am optimistic in two ways. First, political regulation. The first political regulation has to ask three questions. The first one is, what data can be taken away. The second one is how much data can be taken away. Uh, maybe I say what I mean with it. What data? Your heart rate, your breath rhythm. Um, Elon Musk is even working on your brain, like to read out your brain. I mean, this guy is crazy, but still, um, maybe he succeeds. If he succeeds, we have far more problems. <laughs> Uh, how much, um, like to what extent is it allowed to take this data? And the third one is which third parties are allowed to take this data? Who's still also in the game? Um, and these regulation questions must be raised as soon as possible, looking at the plans of Mark Zuckerberg, because 10 years, even if he succeeds within the next 10 years, it's not a lot of time. We have wasted 15 on the digital platforms, social media, we, shouldn't, we should control the beast before it grows up, I would say. The second one is, and I come back to, the, to your Roblox example and the high numbers. I, if I remember comp uh, correctly, Roblox once said that each user spends, in average, $60 in this game, approximately. Um, there was an approach like f uh, six years ago in 2016 to buy Twitter. Uh, it was worth... I don't know, 300 million, I don't know how much, but each user had to spend $100 to buy Twitter. Um, of course, it didn't succeed. Now Elon Musk is buying it for 44 billion instead of 30 billion. This was the number, I think. Um, but deprivatization is something, and I, if I understood correctly, Ben Tarnov is after, after us. Um, and he's talking about that a lot, and I think this is something we should think about, and this is the second approach beside regulation, is deprivatization. Uh, which means like ownership, who owns the digital infrastructure of the future. And I think it's not only the state, public ownership, but it's also, oh, I don't know the English term, in, in German we say Genossenschaft. What, what is it? In? Cooperatives. Cooperatives, Ex thank you. Yeah, co cooperative uh, is another example of how we can deprivatize and gain ownership over digital infrastructures and by this make the rules about data and how it's used and exploited or not. This is my little bit of optimism here.
A já za něj moc děkuju, a protože já tady mám ještě... Thank you very much for that. I have many questions. One of them is about the more positive and alternatives and what we can do. So I am happy that you get to that in the last answer. But I would now like to give the floor to the audience. Do you have any questions for any of our guests? And if so, please raise your hand. And you need to ask the question on microphone because of the interpreting. I can see one hand in the last row. I can see two questions in the row, so maybe can you ask both questions one after the another? The microphone is not working. Aha. It's working. Thank you very much for the, the very exciting discussion. I will follow up to the, the positive line. You said that we were in a kind of a global, we were looking at it from a global perspective. And uh, what about the local level? Do you know some local examples of uh, using internet for some uses, uh, for some needs of some communities? For example, communities can Uh, so, so some uh, local groups can be connected like this. Uh, if I look at it from the, the other end, can the digital platforms somehow support what we want to develop on the local level? Maybe this is a little bit different topic, but some kind of uh, digital currencies or gamification of something? For example, in a part of a city and a district, I do something for the community, and thanks to that, I can use some public space for me, some municipal space, so some kind of gamification elements. Thank you for your question. Uh, I would maybe take the next question too, uh, that was next to the camera, and then we will answer at once. Yeah, uh, thank you for for the panel, and also thank you for the last remark on um, de, uh, deprivatization. I think that's just the way to go. I mean, if you think of it like how absurd it is that the the most central um, ways how we co how we are connected and how we work and how we live are in the hands of a of some person in the USA <laughs> who can like according to his mood change uh, how how this whole things work. I mean, this is just completely absurd. But what I wanted to say is um, that um, uh, something that uh, came to my mind was that I mean I think one of the reasons why um, digital spaces are and especially this goes for games, of course, are so uh, seductive uh, to us is because they work um, somehow in, in with the mechanisms of escapisms. Uh, escapism, so of course, one of the main reasons why people like to play games is also to escape from shitty reality, uh, from the real world, and, um, um, and, and, and probably most digital spaces can be something or can be described as something like uh, Uh, Michel Foucault described as heterotopias, like uh, spaces, real existing spaces that are kind of utopic spaces. They have some utopic um, um, aspects that why that's why they existed. But they are in reference, but also in opposition to the real world. Um, and um, how you now describe as the future of digital spaces something that is very absolute, something that is basically devoured even more aspects of our life. Um, ca ca can that actually work? I mean, if you think of it like, can these digital spaces still be escapistic if we are there anyways all the time with everything? How, how, does, that, does, that, does that make any sense? I mean, where we, we cannot escape into them if we are there already all the time. So um, maybe that's something that, that, that will kind of 
not turn out or in, maybe in other words like if 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 they have already devoured everything how can can it still work can can it can it still work if anything is already inside it Thank you very much for a great, great question. I think that the second question is a question for Leonhard, but I will repeat it. So the first question is uh, to look for more positive examples in a local context. And I think it is great that uh, somebody said it. So can we imagine some positive use, grassroots use of uh, the platforms? So does anybody want to answer this question? Katka, maybe? I can start. I will, maybe this will not surprise you, but I will start with a pessimistic remark. The problem with alternatives, grassroots alternatives, is that they are structurally in a very weak position compared to the giants. Uh, they don't have enough money, know-how, reach. And this is a thing that is very hard to break. This is a very uh, general question. This uh, leads to a more general question of uh, responsible user. So can we, as responsible users, somehow break this disbalance? But I think it's, it cannot be done. We already have some examples of good practice, such as these cooperatives, Maybe you have heard about fair BNB, which should be a counterbalance to Airbnb, which is more fair, which respects the neighborhoods where you where you live. But most of you have never heard about it, and this is exactly that. It is a niche question. It stays among the responsible users because the other users will not learn, will not know about it. Uh, it has no advertisement. There are no network effects. This is not an accident that the platforms are global. They compete for being the global number one in a specific market when they work because it is giving them this power. Because just because everybody is there. And this makes sense uh, because on Airbnb there is a big choice, whereas on Fairbnb there are not so many options. So there are some structural obstac obstacles that make these grassroots initiatives less competitive. But uh, these things exist. You can, of course, think about it. And uh, besides fair BNB, uh, there is one more thing, such as how Barcelona was working uh, with the data from the smart systems, such as parking. There used to be a very progressive lady who was responsible for this. And she said, this data belongs to all of us. So we will keep it, this data, we will anonymize it, because the data can, can be pseudo-anonymized, so you can make them harmless from the point of view of the protection of uh, personal data. And then they gave it to everybody. So this data is not given to just one company, but it uh, was given to small communities, community companies, small companies. So they somehow leveled up the advance of big players that would otherwise have the data just for themselves to become dominant on the market. So this is another positive example, which is an example that uh, could not uh, maybe be transferred to some other place, but it is a good example from the grassroots area. Thank you for being a little bit optimistic, at least, for having some positive examples. And now, Leonhard, it's maybe your turn to ask the other very interesting question. If the internet and online spaces used to be a form of 
escapism. But now the internet has absorbed everything and it won't be a form of escape. Can it still work? Um, Robin and me were playing a ridiculous game because he is part of my collect of our collective total refusal and <laughs> giving a question to me here. Um, you have to know that um, it's uh, <laughs> so. I I want you also maybe maybe you have a, a different answer. Robin is more keen to because he knows my knowledge. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I think um, the, the, the it's interesting using like uh, um, internet or vid I can answer for video games um, as an escapism because living in a world with so many crises uh, simultaneously we we like es escape into realms which are extremely apocalyptic. So most of the games are post-apocalyptic, zombie, mega-corporation, dystopias, whatever. So it's, and, and then you have this nice little um, um, non-dystopian uh, realms, which are even more um, dystopian, like a Disney's Dream Valley, um, which, is <laughs> which is like really a, um, um, how do you say, a revisionist um, a nightmare of, of a dream. Um, so these are the, the non-dystopias are the, are the, the non-critical revisionist um, realms. So you need to escape in a... In, so this is the first answer. And the second answer is... Um, if we are completely devoured, if, if like everything is devoured by uh, digitality, by the internet, by games and what, whatever, like if gamification makes our world becoming like a dystopian, dystopian corporate game already, um, then we have to step into the, uh, like we, then we are in this, in this, in this, in this game, in this former heterotopia and now completely reality. Um, which is absolute, and there we have to do our heterotropias. So there we have to um, reuse and um, upcycle those spaces in order to appropriate it and make it our own. So it's like with all informal spaces in the city, which are not cooperated and in invested yet. People use it for whatever. Um, and like a good two good examples are like. Um, there is a utopian and a dystopian um, version to every kind of technology, I think. Um, and um, the utopian one is that people grieve to have social spaces, especially after or during corona times. So they build their communities within games, but not, of, not only as the game has intended it, but also in a different way, like the few rats in Elite Dangerous who, is a, who, who invented their um, own gameplay in a highly competitive science fiction um, uh, commander, uh, spaceship commander battle galaxy game in which they just like drive uh, to uh, to game gamers who lost themselves in the uh, uh, um, vast galaxy somewhere and fuel them up because um, they would not be possible would not be capable otherwise to get back to their game like back to their battle so this is this is or or the reaper dogs in um, in in GTA or or in 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 Red Dead Redemption too where like like a gang is is completely reinventing the gameplay of an open world uh, online game where they 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 make a community where you kind of um, um, yeah, like when if someone dies, for example, everyone in the community um, leaves their shift, um, uh, like leaves their work and go to the digital funeral. And there is also a dystopian aspect onto it, uh, which is a, um, which is a like um, Steve Bannon um, story, because um, Steve Bannon is one of the very few. Um, um, demagogues 
who was really aware of this gaming community as a very, very important um, game changer within politics, you can say so. So as he was, when he was in, I think in Shanghai or in Asia, he, he acknowledged like this um, angry man, this stigmatized com gaming communities um, as a vital um, mass of maybe um, important uh, uh, um, criti critical mass for, for his right-wing means. Um, and he, he told this, he always tells this story about, I think it was this John, um, which is like a normal um, guy working in an office and when he suddenly dies, there is just like his mom maybe and then there is a priest making a, um, an arbitrary uh, preaching to his funeral and then six people like leave home and everything is like it was before. But when, but also this John is also playing um, World of Warcraft and there he is named Ajax like this, this Greek uh, semi-god, demigod, um, and, um, and there, when he dies, a community of thousands of people around the world resemble themselves within the game and celebrate his funeral. And then Steve Bannon says, I want to become all of you Ajax. So a thing which like our late capitalism did, it was completely make a lot of people feel powerless and then some right wing like most of the one of the most dangerous guys comes there and empowers them within video game logics and I think the left is now um, maybe in charge to become um, a left wing Steve Bannon no this is not a good end <laughs> word but yeah you know what I mean uh we are getting to the end of our debate. If we have any more questions, please keep it short. Okay, Mr. in the last row. This will be the last question, and please keep it short. I play games on my PC, uh, but I wonder if I could be considered as a professional gamer just because of that. But what I'm interested in is the disproportion between the revenues from PC games and mobile games, which are actually free, and you just buy the costumes or the add-ups. And I wonder if someone who has the power could regulate it very early on, if we can actually do something about this, because the disproportion is absurd. And this also reminds me of the situation with the, the Internet as a whole states are lagging behind and they are not ready to regulate things quickly enough. Thank you for the question and please keep it short also as for the answers. So why this disproportion is there and finally maybe if Katka and Daniel want to say something more, what the role of states can be in this respect? Unfortunately we don't have much time left so keep it short. So, Leonard, you can start. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, just a very, very f uh, um, uh, um, fast um, approach to it. Like, just referring to you two, um, it needs like it, this, this, this um, kind of mega corporations. Um, also, the gaming ones. They, it, it's not enough to regulate. Like, if you regulate, then you're behind. Yeah. So. The people need to own the means of digital production. So, in order to democratize it, those kind of stuff needs to be democratized. This is this is the most important um, thing about every of these answers. Katko, Katka, I don't know what to add now. Well, regulation, I agree with what was said, and I will maybe move to a more technocrat level of the debate. I definitely agree that the problem of the politics is that they are lagging behind. 
the speed of the technological development is so high. Uh, European legislation is being prepared, but I am very skeptical about it because this legislation actually regulated the state of the Internet 10 years ago. But before uh, it goes through all the institutions, it will become a completely outdated piece of legislation for a world that doesn't exist anymore. So this is the problem of politicians and politics. It's not quick enough. The functional mechanisms are completely new too, so you cannot react using the old tools, the cartel law or other types of law, because these are completely new things. We don't know how to regulate. There is this power imbalance, and if you look at the amount of money the companies have, it's often as much money as states have in terms of lobbying and so on and so on. And then there is the question of know-how. These companies hire the best people because they can pay them. And then the best people, the best engineers work for them. So how can state bureaucracy react to this? We can say, okay, they are stupid, they haven't understood what Uber is, which is maybe what you have understood when I spoke about Uber. but. Before we understand this disproportion in terms of finances and power, it is so difficult for the state to really face them, to level up to them. Okay, we should be ending now, but still I would like to give the floor to Daniel uh, for his final word. I have not much to add, actually. I just one tiny thing um, in regard to what Leonard said. I completely, absolutely agree. Um, there's always a debate among me and other editors where, where at my publication, and the debate goes, uh, where do we put the focus on? Do we put the focus on GAFAM, on Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, or do we put it on the state and state surveillance after what we learned from Snowden and others? And um, I never liked this polarization um, because if we want to regulate, if we want to even destroy the monopolistic structures of these companies, we need the state and we need to own the state in order to do that and we need to own the state in order to stop the surveillance of the state. So democratize is actually the key word here and deprivatization is only possible within a democracy and a democratic state in these terms. So that's one thought that I had when you said uh, democratize, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the answers from the audience. And I should now be summarizing what we were speaking about, but I guess the final remarks were summarizing enough. And we said so many things that it would be difficult to sum up any further. But maybe I would just like us to take away that we often speak about abstract threats, but given what we have said today, there are concrete politics, concrete people behind it, including Mark Zuckerberg, and if we take more interest in these concrete structures, concrete people, maybe we will start seeing solutions that are less abstract. Okay, that's it from me for now. Thank you to everybody, and also I would like to invite you for the upcoming panel with Ben Tarnoff, who will probably speak about the privatization concept, together with Teresa Bartonchkova, the founder of the Internet Institute of Czechia, and this panel will start at half past two. So thank you and see you.